appreciated Joe's storytelling and his lessons. Welcome, Dr. Bruchak. Quite why, Nidon Bach. Hello, my friends. De Luis y Souza, Palanoke da Josid. My name is Joseph, we're the peaceful one. In Dai Salatogi, Alana Bizonbik. I'm of the area we call Saratoga, or the Medicine Spring Place, as we would say it in the Abenaki language. And I greet you this morning. One of the things that is important to remember is that we are all linked together in many ways. And I will tell you a little bit of the history of Congress Park, where originally this was going to take place, but it is a little cold today for us to be outside. And so you'll have to imagine that surrounding as I speak. But before I go further, in the old days, as we traveled by the waters of our land on canoe, when we reached a new place, we would uh, sing a welcoming song, a song asking to be welcomed. So I'm going to share with you one of those songs. Imagine me coming in my canoe to your community and requesting permission to land and share with you today. You want to My dear friend uh, Tom Porter, Sukoniwinka, see who win, the winner, uh, the founder of the Ganache Holege community, which is along the Mohawk River, about 30 miles from here, near the city that became known as Kanachahere, which is actually Ganache Holege, the place of the clean pot. Tom and many other elders over the years have taught me that it is most important to say thanks. When we say thank you, we are acknowledging all the gifts that are given us by this earth, by our creator, by the people around us. And when you say thank you in the Abeniki language, we say ulioni, which means I return good to you. And so it is that the words spoken before all others, as it is expressed in the Mohawk language, the Thanksgiving greeting would be the start of any gathering. And I'm going to do a very short version of that Thanksgiving greeting and then we'll turn it over for the first of three rituals we'll be sharing with you today. This greeting, I ask you to join your thoughts and your mind with me to give greetings and thanks to each that I mention. We greet and thank first this earth, our mother, who gives us all life. And we give our greetings and our thanks to the mother earth, and our minds are together in doing so. We greet and thank the waters of this earth that flow and also bring us life. Those waters that flow through our own bodies, those waters that link us from the small streams to the great ocean, the rain that falls, creating that great cycle of life. So we give greetings, we give thanks to the waters. We greet and thank all the plants that grow up from this earth. We greet and thank the great trees, the smallest of the medicine plants, the corn, the beans, and the squash, the three sisters, as we call them. We greet and we thank all the plants. We give greetings and we give thanks to the animal people, those who are our companions and our teachers. We are told that they were here before us and they are wiser than we are. So we must listen to them and respect them. We greet and thank all the animals. We give greetings and we give thanks to the birds, those whose wings lift into the sky, inspire us with a dream of flight, whose feathers are beautiful with all the colors of the rainbow, and whose songs give us such inspiration. We greet and we thank the birds. We greet and we thank the winds that wash the face of this land, those winds that bring us breath without which we could not live. We greet and we thank the winds. We look further up into the sky, and there we see the great sun, our elder brother. We give greetings and thanks for its warmth and its light and its gift of so many things. We thank the sun. We 
join in greeting and thanking it. When the night comes, the Grandmother Moon shows her face. We give her also greetings and thanks, for reminding us, even in the darkness, we are never alone. And further up, we greet and thank the Awatuwesuk, as we call them in the Abeniki language, the little distant ones, the stars whose patterns teach us and who remind us that life is everywhere around us. And we give greetings and we give thanks to all the people, those we know, those we've not yet met, for all of us, our sisters and brothers and relatives on this great planet. And then we greet and thank the great mystery, the creator of all things. We join our minds, our thoughts, our smiles together and greeting and thanking all. And because I'm small and weak and often forget, may have forgotten something. And so if you want within your own heart to greet and thank anything in particular, please do so right now. And so it is that we join together in thanks and in greeting. I'll turn it over now for the first ritual, which ties into that Thanksgiving address. And then I'll talk next a bit about the native history of this place, Saratoga and Congress Park, where we might, if it were a warmer day, be walking together right now. Now let's open with the Thanksgiving message, what we have to be thankful for, the air, the trees, the water, the sky. For our first ritual, our guides Kenzie and Zuzu will help us to think about giving back with compassion. If we were in person, each of you would have been given a stone to hold in your hand and be asked to think of how you can give back to the earth and to the human family. Now that you have had some time to think, here are some other things to think about. Plant a tree, with tree toga on April 30th, grow something from a seed, conserve water, compost, use reusable bottles and bags, pick up trash, reuse and recycle, repurpose, turn off water when you brush, go to the library for books, and use a wool ball in the dryer. Use reusable metal straws, take a walk, wrap presents in cloth, use a handkerchief, go paperless, donate your time, do a random act of kindness, participate in charity events, help a child, help seniors, teach others, donate things you cannot use, pay it forward. We all have a responsibility to nature and to others. And let me go back again. Thank you for that. And remember, even the smallest thing can have great consequences. And even though there are so many things in this world beyond us, each of us has a voice and a place. And that is important to remember. And talking about place, I think you might like to know a bit about the place that you are now, the place we call Salatogi in the Abeniki language. Uh, the place of medicine, or Nabizonbik, the medicine water place. For thousands of years, at least 10,000 and perhaps more, Algonquin people lived in this place and shared it with all life around them. In the coming of the Europeans, the great changes began to occur in this land, and many of our native people, in particular in this area, it would be the Mohican nation, uh, the Hudson River, bears their name, the Mahikanituk, which actually means the water that runs both ways with the river of tides. And those Mahican people were here on this land until in the 1700s in particular, uh, the wars between the French and the English began to affect our native people in many different ways. Before that, of course, uh, perhaps a thousand years ago, the people of the Longhouse, who are called Iroquois, as actually an Algonquin word, their name for themselves is Hodinosoni, the people of the house with the extended rafters, or the long house. And in particular, in this area, those who are called the Mohawk, again, not their word, they call themselves Ganyenkegaha, the people of the stone, lived and shared this land with the Mohican people. Uh, the great conflicts between different native nations were first experienced among the people themselves of the Longhouse. Those five nations a thousand years ago or so were at war with each other. 
and the Creator sent a peacemaker to point out to them the importance of living together. And so the Great League of Peace was formed with those five nations, and the American government has drawn largely on ideas of the Iroquois in creating the Constitution. Uh, the 50 representatives of the Senate are considered to be somewhat similar to the 50 chosen leaders of the Haudenosaunee who would make decisions together. And at a place called Onondaga, which is still there, a great tree was symbolically planted, and supposedly beneath its boughs we could all come to live in peace. On top of that tree was placed a, an eagle holding in its claws five arrows bound together, for five are hard to break, whereas one is easy to break. And if you look at the American dollar bill, you'll see an eagle on there holding 13 arrows, the 13 colonies. Benjamin Franklin himself suggested that they copy the League of the Haudenosaunee. I am a member of the Abenaki Nation and our Abenaki people. Uh, the word Abenaki or Abenaki did not exist 500 years ago. Uh, it means people who live in the East. We call ourselves al Nobak or human beings. And we are of descent from many different tribal nations who are Algonquin, including Mohican. And our uh, Abenaki people or Abenaki people began to become part of this area around here in the 1600s or earlier. And when the uh, first European came to Saratoga in August of 1767. It was uh, none other than Sir William Johnson. Uh, Sir William Johnson was the uh, sort of uh, crown representative to the Mohawk Nation, and Johnson himself was not feeling well. And because there was something here in Saratoga that was very special to our native people that made it a place of peace, so that whatever native nation you came from, you could come to Saratoga and bathe in or drink its waters. So their great friend, Sir William Johnson, was brought here. He was the first American to experience the healing of the springs. And we say that Johnson himself um, was a great friend of the native people and supported them. And uh, unfortunately, what happened shortly after that, in actually 1776 and the like, is that the Revolutionary War began. And that period from the 17 to the beginning of the 1800s was a period where many native people were forced to leave their lands. And the Mohican nation, uh, many of them ended up in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and then in Stockbridge, Wisconsin, where the uh, Stockbridge Muncie people have their own reservation, but they are still connected to this land. Other native people remained in our area, but kept a very low profile, which might be understandable considering all the things that were happening. In the early 1800s, Saratoga had become a mecca for tourists. In fact, uh, George Washington tried to buy the springs after his first visit here because he was so impressed by it, but he was unsuccessful and instead a uh, little tourist uh, town became a big tourist town. And about 1800, Indian encampments or Indian camps began to spring up where people from the Oneida, one of the five nations, the Mohawk, the Mohican, and the Abenaki began to come and uh, sell the things they had made to tourists. I believe the first Indian camp was actually near Van Damme and uh, Broadway, sort of above the original High Rock Spring. And it was there that camps were set up of, quote, Canadian Indians, <laughs> which is what they like to call us. But in fact, many of the people were from this area, from all around the Adirondack Mountain region, Indian Lake, for example. About 40% of the population is Native American to this day. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, named Andrew Joseph, who was a basket maker and lived in and around Indian Lake, was the last native child born in the Indian encampment in Congress Park, which was the last of the famous Indian camps. And from the uh, about the later 1800s, after the Civil War, onto the early 1900s, that area just above where you see spit and spat. If you go up the hill a little bit uh, near Circular Street, that was the area of that Indian encampment. There was no real native presence visible in Congress Park until, quite frankly, about two and a half years ago, we had the Saratoga Native American Festival there, bringing back that visible presence of native people for the first time 
in many, many years. There's a lot that I could tell you about that whole history of Congress Park and of uh, Native people. And this was our festival program guide, an education guide, which is listed uh, in the site for our program today. So you can find out more about it there. And uh, if we were walking through the park, I would be pointing out things to you along the way. But instead, I'll simply say this, that healing is a central part of all Native traditions. And that Saratoga is a place of healing. Ironically, it's best known for the Battle of Saratoga, which actually didn't take place here. <laughs> but uh, when it was a place of Native people, it was a place of peace and healing. And I think we, feel, we can feel that same peace and that same healing around the springs that flow in and around Congress Park to this day. I'll pass it back again. The second ritual is about interconnectedness and the circle of life. If we were in person, I would have helped us to form a web of yarn and we would have walked together in the way of the sun around in a circle connected. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Our guides, Saiba, Jack, and Luna will join me in reading important teachings about being interconnected. Close your eyes and imagine walking in that circle, connected together. This quote is from naturalist John Muir. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. This is a quote from the Condon. It is a mine Indian proverb. All things are tied together. When you cut a tree whose roots connect with everything, you must ask its forgiveness or a star will fall out of the sky. This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. All things are bound together. The Lakota or the Oglala Sioux, of which Black Elk was a member, believed that everything and everyone is connected. We are all related to each other, as well as to the animals and plants that share this planet. Each of us has a sacred and valued place in the circle of life. You are part of something great. I love that quote from the people of the La Conde Mayan, who are the people of uh, an area we now call Mexico, the area that is uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And I first heard those words from Chan Keen myself in 1992, when my son Jesse and I made a trip to the Yucatan to collect the traditional stories from those Mayan people in the village of Naha. And the great tree, which is uh, referred to that, there are huge trees that grow in the jungles of Central and South America, those rainforests that are used by the native people, using every part of that rainforest and showing great respect to it. And it is said, as Sean Keen said, that before you cut a tree, you must make sure you know why you're doing it. You must ask permission of that tree and the guardian of the tree. For when a tree falls, a star falls from the sky. It's a very beautiful thing to remember that the trees themselves give us such life. In fact, uh, trees are very important to our native people. And if we were in Congress Park right now, I'd be pointing out different trees that have been planted. In fact, uh, a number of years ago there and also near the High Rock Spring, a dear friend of mine named Chief Jake Swamp planted a great tree of peace, a symbolic pine tree. The idea of the great tree was that beneath its roots were buried the weapons of war, that we would join together as human beings for realizing that peace is important. In fact, one of the ritual songs among the Haudenosaunee talks about the beauty and the importance of peace, that peace is needed for the elders, peace is needed for the children, peace is needed for all of us, for all of us are linked and connected together like the roots of the tree stretching through the earth and touching the roots 
of other trees. So there too, you may see that interconnectedness of that great web of life. By the way, John Muir, the naturalist, is one of my favorite characters in uh, American conservation history. It is said that he traveled throughout North America, not said, but it is recorded that he traveled carrying with him occasionally a small bag in which he might have only one or two items. He traveled light and he did not leave much behind him. And within our native traditions, it is said in many of our languages that we should travel through this life as a fish does through water leaving no trace or little trace of our passing, leaving things unchanged as a result of our having been there. Let me pass it on again back to our, our young and very- The third ritual is called the water ritual. If we were together, each of us would fill our cup from the springs and place the water on the roots of a tree before drinking. This ritual is about giving back before you take for yourself. Our guide Riley will read this water ritual from Tom Porter, a Mohawk elder. It is of great importance in native cultures to give back before you take for yourself. We are made of water and we breathe the oxygen from the trees we share to survive. I have here a glass of water. I make it a practice whenever I see the water, when I'm about to drink it, I say, Ulioni Nibi, thank you, water. Because as my friend Tom has often said, we forget to thank the most important things, which are the ones we take for granted. We forget to thank that water itself that we drink. And we don't think of its importance until it's no longer drinkable or until there is none available for us. We don't thank the air that we breathe, even though it's all around us. And being aware of that is important and we might not even remember it until suddenly there's smoke in the air and it's hard to breathe or it is a, a difficult thing to do when breath is hard for us to take when we are ill often breath is a gift that is being denied us so we give thanks to that as well but especially we thank the waters in this this place saratoga this place of medicine water of many springs and so I ask you to think of that yourself with me as I say to this water, Olioni Nibi, and I drink it. It's so good. One of the gifts that we have is a gift of song. And I wanted to share with you a song on the flute. And this song kind of brings together many of the things we've been talking about. It's a very old song. It's actually, from what I have learned in, in my travels, I've discovered, it is used by all of our different Abenaki nations. The Abenaki or Wabanaki, people of the Dawnland, include the Western Abenaki, the Nulhegan and other tribal nations, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, and the Mi'kmaq, people whose Homelands, where we are still living, stretch all the way from Nova Scotia, all the way into the Adirondack Mountains. <clears throat> and this song is called Tutuaz. Tutuaz means uh, little babies or, or the little pine trees. And when this song was played, people would dance in a circle. In fact, the song would be played and sung by the children and their mothers were supposed to dance. And the song would say, dance to one direction and then the other, each of the four directions and turn in a circle as you do so. It's also called little pines because in the forest we see the great pine trees. And I've mentioned the pine tree many times today. And the pine is a symbol of peace, but also a symbol of protection. For when the pine tree is large and spreads out its limbs, the little pine trees grow beneath it, shaded and sheltered by their elders, which is the way that we as the elders, <clears throat> as the grown-ups, the parents, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, should be in relationship to the young people, like those fine young people whose voices we've heard today. We should be stretching out their limbs, our limbs, to protect them as they grow to be taller eventually than we are. I'm playing this on a double flute because it has two chambers, and one is a single note, like a bagpipe. The other you can change. And I wanted to use this because 
when you put two notes together that fit, you create something called harmony. Cooperation. We need harmony. We need cooperation. We need to be able to bring our different voices together and create music. If only walking together. Thank you, Joe. Just checking with you is, um, is this the end of your portion? Yes. Okay. Um, we've put together a resources folder for people that have joined us today. And you can um, look at the link in the chat um, about uh, or go back to the event page and um, a Google link has been made um, available for you for these resources. But today, Luna and Saiba will each take time to explain the resource folder and what we've put in it if you wanna take a deeper look at, um, at the resources um, that explain our indigenous history. By the way, if anyone has any questions after they've reviewed that, if they would like to ask a question, I'd be glad to try to give an answer. Great. That's a possibility, certainly. Sure. Um, we have a resources folder available in the online event detail page. When you register, you will have a Google link to download PDFs. And on that link, we have the Our Story treasure map, which is a Saratoga Springs scavenger hunt. It uncovers interesting facts of history of all of us. Um, we have a deeper look into treasure number two about the High Rock Park's Trees P, Trees, Tree of Peace, planted by Jake Swamp. We have a longer explanation into treasure number three about the first peoples of Saratoga and Congress Park Healing Springs. We have a brochure on the Indokina Education Center, a center that offers people of all ages, unique hands-on learning experiences, principles of indigenous arts of life, team building, character development, and exhibit spaces focusing on regional Native American understandings, Adirondack culture, wilderness skills and awareness of the natural world. The Saratoga Native American Festival Handbook and Saratoga Native American Festival Education Guide can be purchased directly from Joe Bruchak by going to the website www.ndakanacenter.org and contacting Dr. Bruchak to order them. We have our Youth Squared brochure and a description of our mission. We also encourage you to find the Monday Day of Service on the MLK Saratoga Celebration page that lists good ideas of how to help our, our community on an individual basis on Monday and beyond Monday. Okay, thank you so much, Luna and Saiba. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'd like to open up um, a discussion. Joe's willing to uh, answer any questions that people may have um, about our area and um, the indigenous culture and the impact um, on our land. Yes, you could put the question in the, in the chat. One thing I want to point out too is that the way that our indigenous people around the continent used the land, didn't really use it, but worked with the land is important for us to remember. I have friends who are actually in California in different native communities, and they're now advising the state, interestingly enough, on the practice of burning, how traditionally we would burn certain areas of an area that were going to be uh, 
more fertile as a result. It would get rid of brush and therefore large fires would not occur. That practice of traditional burning was also here in the Northeast. In fact, not far from the Saratoga Springs, we have a place called Burnt Hills. And it's called Burnt Hills because that was the way it always looked in the autumn back in the days before burning was forbidden. And this was a practice done by the Mohican and by the Mohawk people to clear away dry brush, to get rid of insects and other diseases that would be found inside the plants so that the next spring, that more fertile and clear land would grow vibrantly with berry bushes. And uh, blackberries, gooseberries, raspberries were all benefited by that burning. And you'll find very few of those these days. In fact, the gooseberry was eradicated, and that's yet another story by a program through New York State. But uh, that idea of living in balance with the land is something that is not, you know, a sort of, uh, <laughs> how shall I put it, silly idea at all. It makes great sense if we wish to consider the future. As Tom Porter puts it, we need to think seven generations ahead. What will be the results seven generations from now of what we do today? Thank you, Joe. Uh, there is a question, uh, some questions. How is Saratoga now honoring the indigenous people of this land? Is there a native community we can connect with? Powwow events? Well, because of the COVID outbreak, a number of events that normally would be taking place have not been taking place over the last two years. For example, the Saratoga Native Festival, which we sponsored through our Indakina Center. The Indakina Center is located in Greenfield, just three miles from downtown Saratoga. But there, too, we've had to restrict uh, access because of COVID. We hope to have programs going again very soon, as soon as uh, the spring and summer come including some uh, small festivals and outdoor programs. We've also been doing online storytelling and projects relating to uh, keeping the center going in the interim. Now, Ganacha Halege, as it is called, is a Mohawk community that was founded by Tom Porter and a group of other native people. It is located along the Mohawk River, uh, just past Amsterdam. Normally, there would be every year a strawberry festival taking place there in June. I'm not sure if it will happen this year or not, because the last two years were impossible for it to occur. The closest um, recognized tribal nations are to the north and to the west of here. The north of here, there is Akwesasne, or the place with the partridge drums, formerly called the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation, on the St. Lawrence Seaway. And part of it is in the river, part of it is in Canada, part of it is in the United States. There's also the Ganyanke community, which is south of Akwesasne, which was a community formed um, in a very interesting event after the takeover of girls camp called Moss Lake near Old Forge, New York. The uh, state granted the use of that land to the Ganyanke people. So there is Ganyanke. There is also to the west of here, the first tribal nation who has uh, recognized property is the Oneida nation, which is nowadays known for the Turning Stone Casino but also is a, a very vibrant community. And we'd have to go much further to the west and to the north to encounter other native communities. Farther to the south, the people of the uh, Shinnecock Nation and the Puspatuk, as they've been called in the past, of Long Island exist. And then to the east of here, we have the Vermont Abenaki Tribal Nations, of whom Nulhegan is one. And we have very little actual uh, tribal land, but we have very organized communities. And I could go further, but that's just a very quick overview. And if you want further information, the Indakina Education Center is always uh, ready and willing to respond if you want to email us or I hope someday soon visit us. Thank you, Joe. Here's another question. How did the indigenous people interact with white settlers? Mm -hmm. The interesting question there is that the first thing that happened is cooperation. Uh, that often the idea of bringing people into your community was very important. And if you take a look at the uh, Mayflower Colony of Plymouth Plantation, they had to institute laws 
that forbade people from going and living with the Indians because the native life was so uh, inviting. In fact, they even destroyed a community called Marymount, which was living like the Native Americans. And uh, they had uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting laws. In fact, there's something still on the books in parts of Massachusetts called the Long Hair Laws, which forbids uh, white men from growing their hair long like the Indians, because it would mean that they were sort of allying themselves with native culture, a uh, very ironic thing. But unfortunately, the pattern that occurred again and again across the continent would be first cooperation and uh, interchange, and then the demand for more land. And people got pushed out again and again and again because of the hunger for land, which was regarded as a commodity by European culture and as your mother by indigenous people. And uh, the many hundreds of treaties that were created throughout the United States all were about taking Indian land. And by the way, every treaty was broken by the United States. It was uh, made with native people. Here in the Saratoga area, the uh, Kateros patent was one of uh, numerous sales of land to uh, Europeans, and these sales were often forced. You had little choice because of the pressure that was being put on you. That said, there is a long pattern of sharing and interchange between indigenous and non-indigenous people. And I would say it is much more a question of government than it is of individuals. The classic example of this is the Cherokee, Choctaw Creek, Seminole, and uh, the people of the five civilized tribes of the South who were forced out and forced to go to Oklahoma, but their neighbors did not want them in most cases to leave. In fact, often their neighbors protected and put up uh, support for them, but the governments of these Southern states uh, saw it otherwise, especially because gold <laughs> had been discovered on Cherokee land. And that is another long story throughout the North American and the South American continents of European desire for the mineral wealth of the Americas. Um, all of that said, I honestly think that the idea of cooperation and of sharing still exists and among many native communities, despite some very sad histories, there is that understanding that we are all commonly together human beings, whatever our color, our race, our language might be, and that for our survival, we need to find ways to cooperate and to respect each other. Thank you, Joe. These questions are so great. Here's another one. What is the indigenous explanation of how we make sense and improve the desecration of land worldwide? Perhaps this question is too global in scope. Also, is there an indigenous explanation of the names for Lonely Lake or Lake Lonely or Round Lake? Well, um, Lake Lonely is actually a European appellation, not one that came from the original native name. And I, I'm sorry to say I've forgotten the name for Lake Lonely. There is a native name for it. Round Lake is a simple description of it. And there was a similar native word that talked about it being that particular shape. Um, often our names for bodies of water depend on where you're living on that body of water. So the same river might have different names according to where people were living along it and sometimes that name would change. But the larger bodies of water, often the names have remained the same. For example, we have to the farther to the west of us, we have uh, the lake called Ontario, and as that is Scanyodayo, which means it is a beautiful lake. And we have to the east of us, this long river, which is called uh, Kwanitulk, which means the long river, which became Connecticut, and if you look at most of the place names, often they're descriptive of where you are and what is going on there. So Mahikani Tuk, the Hudson River, is a river that is a tidal river that flows up and down, back and forth. Um, there's some discussion of uh, maybe not so clear what the word Kairos or Kairosos comes from, but it seems to be something like rushing or running waters. Uh, a lot of our names that we now see on the land are... Um, corruptions of an original native name or a misspelling so that people uh, don't understand. For example, Kuksaki, uh, people have said, oh, it's an owl place. No, Kuksaki is Skulkski, uh, a snake place, because there were a lot of snakes around Kuksaki in the past. Uh, I could get a long discussion going about native naming. My, my son, Jesse, who teaches our language and is the head of the uh, Middlebury Abenaki School of Language, uh, 
is uh, has been putting together a list of Vermont names and New England names that are all original names for places, and some of which uh, still remain on the land. What has confused things in New York State is that there was a period in the Victorian era when some very well-meaning people decided to put back native names on places, and they made up new names so that Mount Marcy became Tahoz, which was not the original name for it. It was simply Wombi Wadzoak, the big white mountain, and so too was Whiteface. <laughs> some places might have the same name, and Tahoz is actually a made-up name based on a misunderstanding of an Iroquois word doesn't really mean the cloud splitter, but that's yet another story about names and naming, which could be long and telling. Uh, back to the original first question. Yes, there are basic understandings that are here in our native teachings that if were applied widely would change things. And I think that's true all over the world. There are indigenous people, for example, the Chipiko movement in India, uh, the tree huggers, the women who tried to protect the forests, who recognized those are central to our lives. Or the idea that if we just let old growth forests that still exist remain in place, they would sequester more carbon than younger trees do. We believe the old trees, traditionally in many of our cultures, are elders. They are guardians. They are like people, or we are like them. <laughs> and that they are meant to be there and we're not supposed to cut them down. So I think that a lot of the practices of uh, contemporary European-based culture, um, and actually other parts of the world, I have to say that Asia is often just as complicit in carbon emissions and destroying things. If those practices were reversed or native traditions were used, I think we would see a great change very soon. It is believed, and I think believe meant maybe understood, that if we just leave the natural world alone long enough, it will heal itself. But if we keep doing the same things again and again and again, the healing process is impeded or prevented. Oh boy, Joe, I really, I really appreciate your words. Um, here on that is uh, more of us are realizing that the wisdom of the native people is just what we need to begin to turn around the climate crisis. How can we manifest this vision? You certainly did a great job of talking about that. Here is another question. I am from the Indian Lake area, have a Beneke background, and recently completed my third historical fiction book, Destination Tama, uh, Tamaqua Ter Territory. Yeah, Beaver. <laughs> um, I'm writing historic, the historical story of the Beneke in the 1600s next. How can I contact Joe for more information that may be? may be of interest or not of interest to others? Well, I have a website, josephrushak.com. My email is widely known. You can find it on the website. Be happy to talk to people. And yeah, Indian Lake is such an interesting community. I have to tell you a little story from Indian Lake, which I find typical of what we have to deal with. Uh, a friend of mine was, who's of Beneke descent, was taking the census about 20 years ago. And she would go to one house and say, what's your, you know, your race or whatever. And they'd say, oh, we're white. She'd go to the house next door. Oh, we're Indian. And then she'd walk away laughing because they were two brothers. <laughs> and one was saying he was white. One was saying he was Indian because, quite frankly, being a native person was not a safe thing often in many parts of New York State and Vermont. In Vermont, they actually had a eugenics project sterilizing people. Uh, a good friend of mine, whose name I won't mention, who was an Abenaki woman in Vermont, told me that more than 300 of her relatives were listed on the eugenics project as people who should be recognized as sterilization uh, candidates. And this was done all across the Americas with people of indigenous and African-American communities where uh, forced sterilization took place. So th that's one reason why often you may not know that there are native people in your community because we have learned, many people have learned keeping a low profile is safer. My own grandfather, who was very visibly Abenaki, uh, would say, I'm French. <laughs> and people would say, why are you so dark skinny? He'd say, us French is always dark. <laughs> and they listed, uh, American Indians were listed as colored in the census records of the 1800s, which has confused things considerably. Uh, there was a man named uh, George Speck 
whose name was misread uh, as George Crumb because Commander Vanderbilt, who often got food from him when he was a cook, misunderstood Speck and thought it was Crumb. Uh, George Speck was an Abenaki chef, but he has been described as African-American, and Pete Francis was an Abenaki chef and Abenaki guide, who has also been described as African-American. There's even a children's book written about him because he was supposedly the inventor of the potato chip. And that's yet another long story, which is misinterpreted. I just, my head exploded when I opened the Smithsonian uh, yesterday and found an article about how the potato chip was invented because Commander Ver Manderbilt uh, complained about his potatoes not being cooked enough. And so in spite, uh, George Crumb cooked them, overcooked them, which is not true. But there it is in the Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, native history and native culture is often misinterpreted. I simply mention that story because of that possibility, danger, and continued experience of misinterpretation through a European-American lens. Fascinating. Um, <laughs> here, here is uh, fascinating and disheartening in some ways, in many ways. Um, we have uh, a notice, Jesse and James Bruchak, who are Joe's sons, will be part of the featured storytellers at Cafe Lena in February and March three tellers all together each month. So just to let people know about that. Here's another question. How do the practices and beliefs of the indigenous people overlap with the practices of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? That's a great question. But first, let me do another ad. And that is that we are doing at Cafe Lena a benefit for the Flurry Festival, and I will be part of that benefit. And uh, I'm forgetting the date, it's also in February, but I will be there and keep that on your calendar as well. Cafe Lena is one of the great institutions of the world, quite frankly, and deserves our support. And our local Flurry is a predominant, uh, one of the best uh, festivals of dance, music, storytelling to be found in North America and really needs its support as well. To get back to Martin Luther King. I was privileged to march with Martin Luther King and uh, wrote about the Meredith March in Mississippi, which one of those uh, civil rights events that I took place, took part in, I should say. And uh, years later, I went back to Jackson, Mississippi, where, where the word black power was first spoken by Stokely Carmichael. Stokely was a friend of mine, too, and uh, discovered that the principal of the school I was visiting, African-American, was on the Meredith March with me and we had been together marching through Mississippi. Uh, Martin Luther King, in fact, saw many things in native culture and native experience that was parallel. And uh, the idea, uh, in fact, one of the people on that march, Dick Gregory, who was also a friend of mine, an American, African-American comedian, and actually an elder and a teacher in many ways, was involved in fish ins uh, supporting native fishing rights in the Northwest. And Martin Luther King, talked about all people, not just African-American people. And I honestly believe that had Martin Luther King's life not been cut short so tragically, that there would have been even more connection between his work and the work of indigenous people for indigenous rights, because there are parallel paths. And the philosophy that we are all part of a larger human family, the idea that we need to maintain a strong spiritual center, a strong spiritual center is certainly there in our indigenous cultures as well. And uh, I found little that I would disagree with, if anything, I would disagree with in the teachings of Martin Luther King and their uh, parallel relationship to our indigenous teachings. So uh, I'm almost crying right now, but. <laughs> Yes, and I, I would like to add that I think the indigenous teachings even takes a step further, which is not only looking at the human family, but looking at our natural family. And what you spoke about, Joe, about trees being sentient beings, they give us the oxygen that we breathe, they give us so much, and we need to uphold their rights and think about giving back to the land. And as you said, letting the land be able to be, just be itself and heal itself and not impact the land so much. Mm -hmm. Here's another Here's another question. Just like the colonists uh, destroy the land and the people then come back and ask for native wisdom to heal what was um, 
parasitically uh, destroyed. Uh, God bless my neighbors, na God bless my native tribes. Um, this is from a Blackfoot Indian here. Any comment on that, Joe? Yes, that is one of the great ironies that after people have messed things up, then they come back and say, can you fix it for us? And I honestly have to say, let me put it this way, you have to fix it for yourself. You have to take individual responsibility and you can learn from indigenous teachings. You can learn from indigenous examples, but don't think of native people as being perfect. Understand that we have the stories, we have the traditions, we have these things because we need them. As I'll go back to my friend Tom Porter again. Tom told me that the first original teachings that were given to human beings were to always be thankful and behave in a thankful way. And if you do that, everything else will fall in place. But human beings forgot. And I'm talking about indigenous people among the Haudenosaunee. And so they were given more teachings. And in those teachings, they were given the clan system. They were given ceremonies. And again, this was meant to maintain balance. And yet a third time, they forgot. And each time, new teachings were returned to them to remind them of the importance of keeping these things together. And the last of those uh, great teachers was the one we call the peacemaker, who brought together the five warring nations and made one um, nation connected together, bound together, sharing together, mutually supporting. And if you look at, I would say, uh, you know, the Siksika and the Blackfeet nations, they have a similar understanding. They have teachings that are so powerful and important, but are often not recognized or known by uh, the wider American culture. And those teachings almost always lead us back to a relationship which must be maintained between all life, that we are part of that great web. And if we break the strands, then everything else will collapse. Okay, such words of wisdom. Um, this one was talked about the connection between the indigenous people and the African American community. Um, here's another question. What can our schools do better in sharing the Native American experience, particularly local history and events? And I know, Joe, that Indakana really, really tries to, uh, I know from my own grandchildren and talking with them about their camp experience really tries to embed in the young ones um, these lessons. Um, but what do you think our schools can do? Well, fortunately, we can't do it right now because of the uh, pandemic, but uh, we have had a long tradition of having school visits come to our center, come through our nature preserve, um, listen to programs, hear us do storytelling. And I think that if schools can reach out to the indigenous people in their area, uh, if you are, for example, in the area of South Dakota, there are many tribal nations around there who would be able to respond and provide you with guidance. And there are native teachers all around this continent. But even if we're not talking about individuals who come in person, which is certainly important to do, there are books that are written by native people. There are histories. There's a new indigenous history of the United States for young people that my friend Debbie Reese, who's a really wonderful person, was involved. She's a Pueblo person in putting together. There are many resources. And there is the National Museum of the American Indian, which has a branch in New York City and also in Washington, D.C., which normally has a tremendous educational outreach. Again, the last two years have been very difficult for us to continue with this. But uh, those are just a uh, a few thoughts and let me point out something else to you the way i see our interconnection is a result of many years of of experience and travel on my part i was fortunate enough from 1966 to 1969 to be a volunteer teacher in west africa and immediately i discovered two things one how similar tribal cultures are around the world that recognition of the importance of community interrelatedness and maintaining a system of life that will be sustainable for generations to come and not just for a brief lifetime or a presidential uh, campaign, but will be something that will last into the future. 
And secondly, about the uh, second month I was in Ghana, I was teaching in high school area age kids. And I looked out and I thought, gee, that, that guy there looks just like my best friend from high school. And my best friend from high school had blue eyes and blonde hair and a very fair complexion. We in this country are often blinded by color. We don't see faces. We don't see people. We see black. And we don't see the individual. And my eyes were, uh, you know, it's like this veil was lifted from my eyes from that experience of living in West Africa. So uh, see each other as people is one of the most important things we can do. Not be blinded by color, by language, by culture, uh, by preconceptions, but judge each human being as a human being. And don't judge, just experience. Yes, see each person as a person. Uh, one last question, because we're nearing our 12 o'clock hour. Um, well, an, an announcement first. The storytelling at Lena's is February 22nd and 20, and March 22nd uh, with Jesse and Jim Bruchak. One last question that's pertinent for today, Joe, is what is the indigenous teachings for the pandemic and supporting ourselves spiritually? What has helped you get through? Well, I have to say one thing I hear constantly throughout Indian country is this is not our first rodeo. <laughs> we have been through this before. New England was depopulated or 90% of its native population by various plagues that went through uh, smallpox, influenzas, etc. Um, so that uh, we are survivors and we have survived in the past, but we survive by taking care of each other by respecting each other, by listening to each other. And uh, that idea that uh, we are, uh, are once again facing something like this on a worldwide basis. My own great grandfather died in the influenza epidemic at the early part around uh, World War I that swept across the world. So it's not the first experience. And there are many parallels to the way people responded to it, including um, resisting masking and uh, gathering in public places when it was unwise to do so. So all I would say is that our understanding is in these difficult times, we have to take care of each other. A very, very important thing to do. And that can be done in many ways. Thank you so very, very much, Joe, for sharing your wisdom, for opening up this, this the questions and answers were, uh, section was was really important and I want to give a special thanks to Riley, Eliza, Luna, Jack, Kenzie, Zuzu, Saiba, and Jonathan, all people from the Youth Squared Board um, of Directors. Um, thank you so much for your contributions of highlighting the rituals and the messages and the teachings that that Joe um, shared with us today. So thank you, everybody. Um, please, please um, go to the resource uh, folder, uh, check out the uh, Indakina Education Center and the guides, uh, the historical guides from the Native American Festival. Um, check out um, also the Our Story treasure map and especially Jake Swamp's planted tree of peace in a high rock, go find that and read about it, um, as well as walking when it's not frigid weather through Congress Park and um, feeling um, what we experience today uh, together on the land. And thank you so, so very much. Be well and be safe. Thank you, Joe. Maybe we could all unmute and just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.